going to start the record first and then I am going to go full screen. Okay. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome once again to the uh, yeah. Thoracic Gurus uh, series. Uh, it's indeed an honor and a privilege today to invite our speaker for the day, uh, uh, Dr. Adrian Ui uh, Seng Wai. Uh, Adrian and I go back a very long time. We did a residency training together in the UK. Uh, and then around the same time, both of us decided that we wanted to go back to our respective countries uh, to help set up uh, thoracic and uh, uh, cardiac uh, bridge. So Adrian actually went back. Uh, he was a consultant yeah. cardiothoracic surgeon in uh, Singapore. He spent uh, a good number of years in Singapore. And now in the last couple of years, he has moved from Singapore to his home country, Malaysia. He works in Kuala Lumpur and he also works in Malacca. He is actually heading two or three centers now. And uh, he does a lot of work in terms of cardiac. And he also does a lot of work in terms of uh, thoracic surgery. Adrian is one of the proponents of uniportal surgery uh, in, in the Asian countries. He has been part of the uh, thoracoscopic teaching program across Asia. And we meet regularly in our... Uh, programs uh, in, in, in the Far East. Adrian, uh, thank you very much for giving us the time to, uh, to talk to our audience. The audience is a mixture of uh, young and senior uh, cardiothoracic surgeons. Uh, a lot of them are actually exam going. Uh, they are people who are acutely going in for FRCS exams. Uh, there are some people who are going in for uh, MCH exams and some are going in for DNB exams. So uh, okay. I, I, as we discussed earlier, my suggestion would be to address the exam going students uh, and we will have a question and answer at the end to allow them to, to ask uh, questions because they really value this opportunity to interact with you. Uh, may I request all the participants to please switch off your microphones. It's absolutely essential. Uh, Adrian, I'm going to switch off everybody's microphone and you will have to restart yours uh, because I, 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 so I will switch off everybody's microphone and now restart your microphone so that you're audible to us. Uh, restart your microphone, please, Adrian. Okay, I, I'll do it for you. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Thank you, Adrian. Okay, all Adrian, right. take it away. Right. The floor is all yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Zamir Khan. Uh, my buddies and uh, my mentor actually and uh, inspiration guru at the same time. Uh, I think uh, it's a, a wonderful opportunity for me to share uh, what I learned and uh, a great honor for me to, to meet all of you guys here tonight. It's midnight here in Malaysia actually. Okay, so as uh, Zamir said, uh, since we parted our ways, I came back to uh, Southeast Asia. I work in Singapore, a full hospital, and uh, six years there. I um, I love doing what I do, and I engage in a lot of teaching. It's not just postgraduate teaching, and also uh, surgical residency, the nursing school, medical students, and I decided to go back to Malaysia <coughs> to help my country. I work in the Ministry of Health. Uh, cardiothoracic center at Serdang Hospital and I was lucky uh, I worked there for free for free just to show the love of my country the Ministry of Health City Center I worked there every week and it's free I don't get any salary at all and for that I they allowed me to uh, uh, do work at the private center okay so it's a good partnership I also a lecturer and examiner in the Medical College of Malaysia, Padana University, and I managed also to organize the first Malaysia Uniport Vets Masterclass, and also as a faculty at Asia Congress Surgery, College of Surgery Malaysia. So actually, like Zamir, uh, see one, do one, and teach one is our principle. So anyway, today, um, I have a pleasure of talking about um, Empayima and management. And if you look at the title, it says uh, VATS decortication, okay? And you think, think about it, VATS decortication and Unimode VATS, I'll explain to you later, okay? Uh, so, <clears throat> my lecture, 
are divided into four parts. Okay, first part is to see why is it important in Paima. Okay, and what is in Paima? Okay, and the second part is that is there any evidence that whatever we do as a surgeon works for empyema? The third one is actually how do we deal with empyema? So principle of surgery, I think this is that part is the most important part, especially for trainees. And number four, to me, I think it's the least important is how to do it. Where I show you what I do, it doesn't necessarily mean it's right, but I just share my experience. Okay, so we look at the first part. Is empyema important? Well, according to World Health Organizations, the world top 10 killer disease, you look at that table there, six out of 10 the top 10 killer disease like for cardiothoracic and lung infection alone consists almost 10% of all death every year, okay? Especially for lower and middle income countries. Um, well, that data was 10 years ago. Uh, more recent data, five years later, they update this data every five years. And you look at that, it's almost the same. A lung infection and tuberculosis, the incident is there and never changed. And it's 10% of death due to that alone. And so that is important. So you're doing a very important disease around the world. Now, talking about empyema, what causes empyema? Right, um, you can see there are many deaths, patient factors due to delay consultation when they are unwell, they don't go and see a doctor, or they go and see the traditional therapies, either be Indian or Muslim or Chinese uh, TCM, you know. And when all the therapy fail, then they come to see a physician or a patient who is immune compromised. They can contribute to development of uh, empyema. Or patients are sick with chest infections, inadequately treated through effusion, pneumothorax or hemothorax, all of those can cause empyema, right? If you have pneumonic effusion, that will turn into empyema. Pneumothorax, okay, they, because when the lung collapse, you cannot absorb the through effusion. Plus, if they have infections, they turn it into empyema. Chemothorax is the worst. The blood is the best culture to, 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 to turn the blue into pus. Okay, pus your cavity. Or the third one, community acquired, um, TB, vocal pneumonia, mycotic infection, viral pneumonitis, all that will cause empyema here. Okay, others like right heart failure, endocarditis, liver abscess, will get pulmonary abscess and pyema. Okay. And not the least is a surgeon cause, postoperatively, you get atelectasis, pneumonia, bronchoprofissula, all that. Okay, all of those can cause empyema. Okay, so when you get empyema, the patient, what is the outcome? What's the consequences? The consequences are these. Sepsis and respiratory failure. First, can you see my cursor when I'm moving around? You can, right? Yes, we can, Adrian. Yes, we okay, can. Okay, yeah. Now, for empyema first, you got infected pleural space. When you infect pleural space, you got sepsis here. Okay. The second one, when you have infected uh, 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 pleural effusion, the lung co collapse, and that effusion is acidic, and it causes the visceral pleura to react, thicken, inflame, and thicken, and you have a trapped lung. Okay. And then for the trapped lung, you reduce lung expansion, the respiratory failure. Don't forget, okay, the, the parietal pleura is also inflamed and thickened, and you've got fibrothorax, you can reduce chest expansion, reduction of hemithorax, you got respiratory failure. Okay, so this is a lethal combination, sepsis of the lung and mechanism of respiratory failure. So for that, you could die. Okay, so we have to understand that. So if you understand how empyema kills, you, this is how you treat empyema, okay? Now, for empyema, prevention is the best way. It's better than that, okay? If we do a careful surgery, we prevent the fistula. And if, if all the chest infections are adequately medically treated, okay, they don't get pneumonia infusion, they go to pneumonia, they don't get empyema, uh, right? 
And of course, if patients uh, and public are well educated, they know that they have chest infection, they need to see a doctor. Then of course, empyema can be prevented, but all those are easier than said because on many occasions when we see the patient, it was already too late. Okay, so when a patient comes to us with empyema, established empyema, from the consequences of empyema, you understand how was the principle of empyema surgery. Okay, first we need to drain the infected pleural space, right? So pleural debridement, control the sepsis. Secondly, after draining the pus, you need to untrap the lung. Okay, so we do visceral pleurectomy. Okay, the third one is to prevent fibrothorax, okay, parietal pleurectomy. So these three will get rid of the sepsis and prevent respiratory failure. Okay, the principal empyema surgery. Now, the definition of empyema, we all know that. Every examiner will ask you this, what is empyema? Okay, accumulation of pus in the pleural cavity. They used to be called pyothorax or pleural pleuritis, caused usually by pyopneumonia effusion, okay, or cursor gives here, or post-operative bronchopleural fistula. But I must stress, post-operative BPF is getting less and less because of advent or stapler technology. Last time when we do a lung resection, we cut and we oversaw it. Now with the stapler, it's very good. The incidence of BPF is, uh, is hard to see now, actually. Now, so empyema, the cause, and there are three stages. Okay, first is the exudative phase, second fibrinopurulin, and the third one is organizing phase. The exudative phase is where you have pleural effusion with infection, fluid accumulates, Usually, typically, it's about two to four weeks. Sorry, it's one to two weeks, the so stage one. As it progress, the fibrin uh, clot set in, causing loculation, okay, and the pus also set in. It's about two to four weeks, okay, stage two. And the final stage is the stage three. It is untreated because it becomes a scar of the pleura, the lung is entrapped, and the chest wall is also entrapped, okay? So you have organizing phase. Three phases, right? Phase stage one, two, and three. Exudative, fibrinopurulin, and organizing phase. Remember these three because all these three stages have different treatment altogether. All right? And you can see from the chest x ray here, the first stage you may see blunting of the angle. You don't really see anything else. Okay? The second stage, you can see that this is more organizing now. The, the lung started to collapse, okay? And the third stage, okay, you have a lot of scarring, the lung collapse even more. And you look at the rib space, it started to have rib crowding. Now, before we move on to how do we deal with it, we're talking about decortication, right? So is there any evidence that decortication, what we do actually helps them, okay? And the question is for all of you is that do we do decortication for all the patients coming to you with empyema? Do you? Or do you do chest brain? Do you do fibrinolytic therapy? Or you just decorticate everyone? Okay. And think about it. What is the evidence out there that you're doing? Okay. And is there a different treatment modality? I mean, for treatment by vets, is, 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 for me, I prefer by vets because to reduce morbidity, I prefer VETS. And it's not just that I like to do VETS, but there's actually evidence that VETS procedure is effective. Let me show you. Okay? So the first is the... I, I divide the evidence into five parts. Okay? The first one is, does decortication work? Okay? We have to show the evidence to you. Okay? It does. The second one, are there any evidence for different treatment modality for each different stages of empyema, stage one, two, and three? Number three is postoperative empyema, BPF. How do we deal with it? What's the best way to do it? And number four, is VETS decortication effective? And number fifth, is there any new or less minimum or less uh, invasive technique out there to deal with uh, empyema? Okay, let's look at number one. Does decortication work? Yes, there are plenty of evidence out there, okay? Um, 
look at the first one, choice of first intervention is related to outcome in the environment management. Okay, Wozniak and from, from 10 years ago conclude that VATS or thoracotomy decortication has initial treatment or choice for advanced alpha is associated with a better outcome. So if you just treat the patient with IDV antibiotic or just put a chest drain, the outcome is not as good as doing a decortication. So we can justify to say, yes, we do a thoracotomy and the evidence that they fare better. Okay. Now, also John Carr from Michigan, the American, published a paper in 2011. He's a five-year series, 478 patients. It actually says that if you do a decortication, it is more effective in restoring full pulmonary capacity than other treatment of empyema. So this actually makes sense because apart from draining, you do untrap the lung and prevent fibrothorax. So you have full, you can restore full pulmonary capacity. So for that, they prove to the chest physician and say that decortication actually works and you must do decortication. Now, so <clears throat> coming to here, do you decorticate everyone in Empyema? You look at Thomas Molnar, okay, as a famous Hungarian uh, thoracic surgeon, way back in 2007, okay? He already said, uh, review, do a review paper of current surgical treatment of thoracic Empyema in adults, okay? Uh, the conclusion is that he put is that there's no universal primary treatment modality for every single stage. And there's no uniformly predictable success outcome that's available. Everyone is different. However, he, he divided the treatment to five basic uh, principle intervention. You do drain H for initial treatment modality for stage one, maybe that's enough. But for debridement, by VATS is safe and reliable and effective for stage one and two, okay? But for, the, for, for stage three, you must do decortication. What about for patients with high risk, with chronic empyema, you can just do an open window, okay? But for BPF, you do thoracomyoplasty. So he actually clearly line up that different condition and the causes, you do different things, you will have successful outcome. Okay, so that is a very good paper, you read it. And also the surgeon from Israel published a paper that, um, what happens if a patient has too high risk? And do you do conservative management or surgery? Well, this one, it shows that for 119 patients, uh, initially they do the drainage, but eventually 23 of them who drainage is not successful, they need to do the decortication, but the mortality is very high. Okay, and he concluded that intraoperative drainage with urokinase, okay? is acceptable and beneficial in high-risk patient, okay, for high-risk patient, okay? And however, for those without significant comorbidity, surgery may be considered. Okay, so you have to think very carefully for patient with chronic empyema and high risk, what you're gonna do, okay, yeah. So we know that decortication works, has evidence for it, the different stages of, uh, of, of, of empyema, different cause, and different treatment, all right? And it's shown in the evidence. Now, what about evidence for management of BPF and post-operative empyema? So we all heard the word open window thoraco, uh, thoracoplasty, okay? So if you have um, uh, BPF, okay, and empyema, then you can do open window and the lattice dorsi flap to close the local fistula. It's relatively simple and it's relatively safe. He did it in 40 patients and only one died. Okay, over 15 years of experience. So that is one of the paper who said, yes, let's do a window and lattice, uh, lattice dorsi flap for the BPF. Okay, then um, also, um, true empyema after lung resection over uh, open window thoracoplasty alone rather than myoplasty, okay, um, is significant predictor for empyema healing. So if you have lung resection and immediately you know that, uh, the, that there's a BPF, there's an infection, instead of do a full uh, muscle flap, 
we can take the intercostal muscle and, and wrap around the BPF and close it up, and it's pretty good, okay? Such as this one from Switzerland, okay? Taylor thoracomyoplasty is a valid treatment option for chronic post-op lobectomy and pyuma, okay? Without proceeding to the window. So we can actually do a thoracoplasty, clean up the chest wall, and close it up, okay? So if it's chronic, we can do a BPF, and a window and a microplasty. If it's not, we can just do a thoracoplasty and close it up. Okay. And the fourth is showing you what I do. Okay. So decortication work. What about vast decortication? Okay. Now, this is a nice paper from Cardiolo from Rome. Okay. Uh, chronic post pneumonic empyema. Comparative merits of vats versus open decortication. Publish it over 10 years ago. It's a 10 year series over 300 over patients. 40% of them he did open decortication with 1.3% mortality, that's very good. And he did 60% of the case later with that. Of course, there's no mortality, but there's a slight recurrence, okay? However, what he says is that VATS significantly reduce the post of pain, early operating time, hospital stay, and returning to work, faster returning to work. Um, the general principle of VATS also apply to uh, decortication. So when I started uh, VATS uh, decortication in Singapore 2009, I was thinking of writing my series. When I look at this, I say, wow, people have done it more than 10 years ago, a 10 year series. So I'm actually a late starter in doing a VATS decortication compared to these people, okay? And the conclusion of this paper is that VATS decortication appears to be the treatment modality of choice for chronic empyema. So yes, it can be done. People have done it, okay? And also, not just him, other people published a series, the Italian group done, did uh, 19 patients. Okay, and 16 has good re-expansion, 2 out of 19 has re-expansion, 1 failed because patient came back as a mesothelioma. Okay, so however, this guy, yeah, sorry to say that, uh, it's not just VATS decortication, he did it on awake VATS decortication. Awake VATS, okay, decortication alone is difficult enough. And do it on VATS and awake patient, you're not talking about lobectomy, you're talking about decortication. Okay, this is extremely good surgery here. Okay, that was 10 years ago. All right, now. So finally, I like this paper, um, uh, Malti Muhammad, and it published in Asian Cardiothoracic Annals. And you can see he compare management, I mean, management of empyema using different treatment modalities. He compare using streptokinase, VATS, and open decortication. Uh, look at the success rate. I don't have to say anything. Okay, the most successful is open. VATS is not too bad. Chapter is only 50%. So the conclusion is VATS decortication is safe and effective. Okay, uh, early intervention with VATS may produce a better clinical result. Okay, early intervention. Okay, yeah. So, okay, so we are clear that there are evidence for decortication, there are evidence of VATS decortication. Okay, uh, well, less invasive technique. I like this paper. It's a German surgeon. It's a single case report. I never tried. I never had a chance to try this. It's a metastatic lung cancer. Developed empyema after uh, chemotherapy. So instead of doing a decord, you open a window, put a wound protector, and put a vacuum suction for 10 days and close it up. So there are many ways of treating empyema. Okay? Yeah. So anyway, enough evidence. So let's come to what is really important here. Okay, how to deal with it. Okay, the principle stays whether you are a trainee or a surgeon. Okay, it will help you to deal with different scenario. Okay, now, empyema. So we know the patient coming to you with empyema. What do you do? You give them intravenous antibiotics. Why to control sepsis, right? And also to treat the underlying lung pneumonia. There's nothing worse than you take the patient into the operating theater and you do a decortication and the underlying lung is full of pneumonia and the patient is going to die. Okay? Yeah. Die of respiratory failure. So you need to control the sepsis first and treat the underlying pneumonia. Give it time. Give it antibiotic first. 
And of course, at the main time, don't forget to put the chest drain to drain the infected pleural fluid, okay? So basically, this tool is to resuscitate the very sick patient. Because what you're going to do for the decortication is you're going to add surgical trauma to a very sick patient, okay? Yeah. So, IV antibiotics, drainage, insert the chest tube using either ultrasound guidance or surgically performed power, if it is, just do it, okay? But if the drain is small, it has a tendency to be clogged by the thick pus. And this is at the time, I think, streptokinase uh, is come to good use. You, you don't give that systemically, you give them through the drain. Clamp the drain and let it out, okay? And the purpose is to break the fibrin clots and it does improve drainage. It works very well at stage one and stage two, okay? But not for stage three. Remember, it's only 50% success on the other paper that they show you. However, when a physician referred me with the stage three empyema with the chest drain, yes, I resuscitated the patient, but I also put in the streptokinase because it does help my decortication. It does help easier. There's no evidence yet. I don't collect enough data evidence, but every time I do it, about three to four days before I do decortication, I give streptokinase and it really makes my surgery a bit easier, okay? And of course, when you resuscitate the patient, you allow times for the family discussion and do some financial counseling because in Asia, it's very important. Uh, um, sometimes you have to pay. Um, yes, if you, if you were lucky in Malaysia to go with gum hospital, everything is free. And, but in Singapore, nothing is free. Unfortunately, they have to pay. So this is even more important for Singapore surgeon. Anyway, so when you, after you resuscitate the patient, you have to consider something very carefully. You really have to assess the patient, whether he or she is fit for surgery. Is he fit for general anesthesia? Okay. Is he, is he is a patient cachexic? Is he diabetic? Is he renal failure? Is he on dialysis? Has he got poor LV function? You know, has he got stage four cancer elsewhere as well? Is he immune compromised? So you really have to assess the patient carefully. And you know, you can't just simply do a lung function test or like a lung reception. Okay. Now, it would be helpful to get um, an anesthetist colleague to assess the patient. Uh, uh, if the patient is lucky and fit for general anesthesia, you can go ahead and do a full decortication, either by beds or open technique, okay? Debridement of pleural space and decortication and pleurectomy to untrap the lung and prevent fibrothorax, okay? Yeah. However, if unfortunately the patient is unfit with multiple comorbidity, they don't survive the decortication and they will linger in the ICU for weeks and then they will die of multiple organ failure. So in this, group of patients, you just do a long-term chest drain. But of course, chest drain is very painful for long-term. That's why you do a rib resection. Doesn't mean that you take out the whole rib. You go to the most dependent part of the lung, okay? And you cut about two centimeter section. That allow the chest drain to come out without impingement on the rib, okay? And then tunnel the, I don't have a diagram to show you, I'm sorry. You tunnel the rib, uh, the, the, the drain, about three or four centimeters in front. So you have, an, you have a drain coming out and then tunnel under the skin and enter the chest through the, the rib window, okay? And you shorten the drain a centimeter every week and you will, later on when the drain drop out, you have a nice track coming out to drain the pus, okay? That is a very acceptable way and to control the sepsis and drain the pus, okay? To treat people with multiple comorbidity. Well, for chronic empyema and post-operative BPF, you can do a window, do a long-term chest strain, or thoracomyoplasty, depends on the situation. There are people coming in Malaysia, patient with the chronic empyema of six months. Six months. And my registrar put him on the operating list. I said, no, you can't do a, a, a decortication anymore because the lung is basically dead. Okay, you have six months of lung collapse on CT scan, and the lungs are trapped full of calcification is non-viable anymore. If you untrap the lung, it's just bleed and bleed, and you have air leaks, and you have respiratory failure, you have failure of controlling the ventilation. So it's a disaster, okay? So for that, you just do a long-term chest drain or just do a window to drain the pass and control the sepsis. 
Okay, so is it clear? I hope it's all clear. We suspect the patient with antibiotics, do the drainage, assess the fitness for surgery. Okay, three things. Always remember that. Okay, yeah. Now, so if we are all clear about the principle of surgery, let's see what I do. Okay, and I hope I won't bore you with it. I'll try to go through uh, the stages of the video. The video are two, uh, best collocation by three ports and by one port. And it's uncut, but it's speed up about 16 times. Okay, now this is a lady who came to me when she is uh, 12 years old. She has pre puberty, and unfortunately, she has TB and pyema stage three. Okay, do you want to do a, do a full thoracotomy on? 12 years old lady? No, you don't, right? And you look at the CT scan here, okay? The stage and pyema, the lung is completely collapsed, it's trapped with thickened visceral pleura, and you also have a thickened parietal pleura, and you also cause fibrothorax. You look at the crowded rib space, and compared to the one over here on the right side, the rib space is normal, okay? And left side, I'm sorry, the left side is normal, and the right side is crowded, and you also have reduction of the hemithorax here. Okay, look at the chest x-ray. So she has typical stage three empyema. So I did uh, three port fast decortication on her. After three hours, this is a picture. Okay, the lung, you can vaguely see the lung expand, but the lung is very odematous, inflamed. Okay, the chest drain is there, central line is there. After a few days, I managed to remove the chest drain where there's no more drainage. You can clearly see the costophrenic angle and lung expansion is good. A year later, you can see she has grown into a lady and, there's, and the lung retained full expansion as there's no more rib crowding. Okay, compared to this one, there's a rib crowding and there's no more rib crowding here. So it's a very good decortication, can be done by VETS. Okay, now. How do I do it? Well, how do you do it? Okay, by VATS, you start with three pot, four pots or five pot, doesn't matter. Try it, okay? Uh, it's hard work, teamwork. All the team need to know exactly what you do, get ready. And it can be very frustrating because the, the lens can be blocked by the dripping of the blood. You may have to clean the lens about 50 times, but just be patient, okay? And, and get to enjoy the work because the outcome is very good for the patient. And okay, this is the picture of the right side up. Okay, this is the scapular border, costal margin, and this is the inferior port, anterior port, and posterior port. Also, port is here, anterior port is here. Okay. Now, this is a video uh, I uh, show you. One of them is, is left sided, that's the cortication. Before I start the video, and you can see that my video scope is hiding inside this uh, plastic port. It's a it's a it's a, um, it's a ten it's a twelve millimeter port. Okay, so I create uh, my my uh, the, the the anterior port window. Okay, I put the port in, and then um, I use a plastic younger sucker to suck out all the blood, and I gently put the scope halfway through. Okay, you put the scope inside, you can't see anything. So the scope is hiding on the pot, okay? Hiding inside the pot, yeah. So. Sorry, Zamir. That's all right. Is, uh, yeah, let me start again, okay? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Don't worry. Take your time. Yeah, we're fine. Just share your screen again, and then. So okay. Um. Okay. Now, when when did it cut off? Did I cut off? Did you hear what yeah, I said this about part, this uh, part, yeah. the the scope should be hiding inside the port, right? Yeah, we heard that. You heard that. Yeah. Okay. Good. So now I start this. Okay. So you can see the scope is still hiding inside the pot. And then I use a plastic younger sucker to put under the pot. And we are in a plural space. So the younger sucker is good because it's not traumatic, it's blunt. 
so I can separate the fluid space and suck out the pus and the blood at the same time. So I, in the initial stage, I just use a Yanker sucker to create the space. Okay, so this is the anterior port, and you're looking directly to posteriorly. Okay, so now I put a posterior port. Okay, so from the anterior port, put the posterior port to port. Now my camera is looking upwards to the apex of the lung. So whatever instrument, use a blunt instrument to push and pull to, to create the, the pleural space. Okay. Now I look it at the inferior, the lung border. So I'm going to insert the third port. Okay. So this is actually exactly what you what you would be doing if you do a uh, open thoracotomy. But of course, you only do it with the the best. When you create the space, now you do the visceral pleurectomy. It's exactly the same as you would do again in the open. You get a Roberts to grab the thickened visceral pleura and you get a peanuts, mount the peanuts and separate the thickened visceral pleura from the lung. Okay? And trust me, it, it, it's not that easy. This is because it's been speed up. It's actually doing very slowly. Okay? Right, so one by one, slowly you take your time, you can peel off the chicken pleura. The thicker the pleura it is, the easier it is to peel off. Okay. You can use a combination of suction, scissors. Okay? And you think that there's a lot of bleeding. Actually, the bleeding is the same as you would do the open thoracotomy. Okay. So now we are looking up to the anterior apical chest wall on the left side. And now we're doing to do the posterior and the, and the apical superior part of the chest wall. So now the, 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 the upper part, the upper lobe of the visual proractomy is done. I'm doing the more difficult one because it's a reverse angle. So I'm doing the uh, left um, lower lobe proractomy now. Okay. So, okay, sorry, there's a wound protector here, right? So basically, after initially, when I use the plastic pot to go in, well, once I have big uh, pleural space and the bleeding is on control, and just put the wound protector. So it's easier for my instrument to go in and out. Okay? The wound protector I use is extra small because actually extra small is also big enough. And you look at all this thick uh, visceral pleura, okay? And I'm going heading inferiorly towards the uh, um, costophenic angle. Okay. So using scissors and the blood traction and suction, um, the only thing is that I did not show you I had to wipe the camera about 50 times. And while I'm doing this, I'm actually enjoying the surgery. It can be frustrating at times, but the most difficult person in this in this whole OT is my is a cameraman, because he has to follow what I do. He has to know what I do, okay. And the OT OT assistant is getting ready now. And this part is a diaphragm. I managed to clear the lung away from the diaphragm and the and the, and the cost of any angle, okay. And do not worry about all this loculation blood fluid because you are not tearing any major vessel over here. Okay. So after I do all that, I will do a washout for the chest drain. And the lung is inflated. Okay, so it can be done. That's how I do it. Okay. So now I show you uh, the second video. It's, it's a uniportal vet decortication, but on the young man, it's a right uniportal, right chest, okay? 
So where is the landmark? This is a nipple, okay? So this is a nipple. So it's about three or four inches lateral to the nipple. This is the anterior port. Okay, inferior port would be here, posterior port would be here. So I go through the anterior port, okay? Because anterior port, you can see the top part, you can see the bottom part, you can access everywhere you like. Okay, can you see I use the interior plastic uh, pot and then I put my younger sucker to create more room space. Okay. And after that, you use a peanut. However, uh, this young man, he, he's bleeding quite a fair bit. So after I create a room space, this is the diaphragmatic border. Okay. And then I go to the apex, okay, right? Okay. So I, you can you can go either direction as long as you have a space. You just follow the pool space nicely, okay? Yeah. Now I'm going up to the apex, okay? So now the space is going all the way up, and he's bleeding. So what I do, I change it to the wound protector and I put a gauze inside and I waited 10 minutes, 15 minutes when the bleeding stop, I continue. Okay, yeah. So I've done the visceral prorectomy in this case, which is easier. And now the thicker part one is actually the parietal pruller. The parietal pruller is really thick. Okay, that's how do you do it? You do however way you can, okay? Using the same instrument, mount a peanut to the robot. The robot is a long robot, so it can reach deeper. And of course, I uh, use um, bats, scissors, and the uh, and, uh, plastic younger sucker. Okay? And you're looking directly from anterior port to posterior chest wall. So I cut above, actually far away from the, um, uh, the uh, descending aorta. Okay? Try not to go close to the aorta. Okay, so I cut the visceral, uh, the parietal uh, puller using combination of scissors because I can't even tear it off, it's so thick. Now, this is the anterior chest wall, it's a reverse angle. I can't pull it off, so I have to use a diatomy to, to, to cut it. Okay. Okay. Then I untrap the lung. Okay, so make sure all the lung is mobile. And now this is a visceral parectomy. Okay, and then this is the star seal uh, powder. It's a hemostatic powder for the drain, and that's it. Okay. So anyway, is it easy? Um, I think it's easy if you know what you're doing and you know the principle of surgery. And is it scary? Um, it can be scary, but remember what Samir said, fear of failure is what keeps you successful. So if, if you try it, okay, and you pay attention, you do a good job, you will be successful. Okay, but the problem is starting up. You have to believe that it works. You have to believe in yourself that you can do it, okay? But you have a leap of faith, continue to do it, nothing is impossible, okay? Yes, it can be very difficult along the journey, okay? A lot of different obstacles that you have overcome. But the more you do it, the more you're good at it. The more you're good at it. When you are good at it, you actually got to enjoy and show off, okay? Now, also for surgery, because we're doing something, we're also always pushing the boundary. We always try to do something uh, more minimal in, uh, invasive, something better for the patient all the time. And for that, you know, the fun part is to you meet up with a colleague around the world, okay, attend a conference, and you train your trainee what to do, okay, so see one, do one, and teach one. And this is what keeps us going. And this is what uh, makes us advance 
the technology and the surgical skill of thoracic surgery. Okay, so anyway, thank you for listening to me. I hope that I can share my little knowledge with you. I hope this lecture is benefit to everyone here. Thank you. I can't hear you, Zamir. Hang on. You have to unmute yeah, thank everyone. You. Yeah, yeah okay. thank, thank you. you. I, I actually stopped my uh, microphone while I was listening to you. Thank you very much, Adrian, for an excellent lecture. Uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, beautiful presentation of the of the literature that's available out there. And uh, good to see Thomas Munner's uh, uh, paper also in there. I was with Thomas Munner uh, a few weeks ago, actually. We were together in Russia. <laughs> and, uh, uh. <laughs> he's just a great, he's a great thinker, and he's a professor of thoracic surgery in Hungary. So very nice to see his paper in there. I think uh, it was a very was, good paper. Yeah. yeah, excellent paper. It's probably one of the best written papers in uh, in that's uh, uh, in in management of empyema. Very balanced paper. It's not. Uh, it is yes. It does not sway towards uh, VATS or uh, VATS or open. It, it's a very balanced mm -hmm. paper. So now I'm going to st uh, start the question answer sessions, if that's okay with you. Uh, Adrian, if you've still got time, would you give us a little more time to answer some questions? Uh, sure, sure. A I, lot I of try people my have best to answer some questions. And yeah, I, yeah. if I can't answer, I hope you help me to answer as well. I will. I'm <laughs> very much there. But, but you have actually opened the can of worms, actually, Adrian, because sure. you, you, you spoke about uh, intrapleural fibrinolytics. And then yeah. you've got all the audience excited about intrapleural fibrinolytics. <laughs> so I'm going to start with the first question that's come across. I'm actually reading from the messages that have come to me. So the first question they've said is, if you do use intrapleural fibrinolytics, uh, should you use streptokinase or should you use TPA? Okay. So what is the evidence for uh, each one of them? Okay. Um, I'm not sure about the evidence. And... Frankly, I don't care <clears throat> because um, as long as the, there's a less fibrin for me to deal with, it's easier for my vets to do. Okay, so and I encourage because sometimes it depends on the referring hospital. They only have streptokinase, they only have TPA. So, and you have to reassure them that actually it's quite safe because these are not being absorbed systemically. Okay, the drain, okay. Um, Everyone that going through a decortication will have a CT scan. And by the time they go for CT scan, you will see that the chest strain has been put in. Unless somebody stuck the chest strain, chest strain inside the lung, you will know immediately there's a lot of air coming out. And, and it, in that case, you put a streptokinase, you could, there'll be a disaster because it'll be absorbed systemically. But majority of the time, the chest strain is been put in, but it doesn't drain much, you do a CT scan, it's a lock related diffusion and it's an organizing empyema and you put streptokinase then the the the, the physician says, oh yeah there's a, a few more hundred uh, one one thousand mils uh, 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 of, of pus come out and the chest x-ray seems to be improved but you know that yes for that the, the sepsis will be controlled and they're on antibiotics but it doesn't solve the problem because the environment is too acidic the inflammatory of the lung and the chest wall continues, the fibrosis continues, and the lung is still trapped. So, but of course, if patient is, um, as I said, is um, unfit, and he is unfit for G uh, GA, that may be the best solution for now. And I will say that, yes, maybe uh, I go in and do a window and, 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 and do a minimum invasive procedure, and that, that's all. Okay, um, but I think it is useful. Trust me, it's useful. If you have a CT scan, the drain is a good position. You you put you know streptokinase in. There's nothing to lose, honestly. Yeah, okay. and of no. course in that there's 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 no. I, I don't have a large series of doing this, and uh, I hope that you guys who have a lot of implementation in, in, in India especially, and you can do the study from this. And it could be very interesting because it also gives the pulmonary physician something to do. As they, they, they otherwise, um, you know, some, sometimes they refer you from other states of India, 
which could be a thousand miles away. So, you know, you give them time to refer the patient and transport the patient to you and get the patient a bit better. Yeah. That, that. So, so my take on this is slightly different, Agent. Uh, I, mm. I, I, I've looked at the literature for mm. fibrinolytics and, and it is not impressive uh, in terms of outcomes. And, and my yeah. take on this is that if somebody wants to try fibrinolytics, it should be the pulmonologist who should try it uh, and do whatever else uh, yes, they want of course, to do of course. Yes, uh, right. before the patient comes to me. Once the patient comes to me, I don't like surgeons uh, putting in fibrinolytics unless you are trying to gain some time. And, and I understood that slide where you said it gives you time to talk to the well, relatives. I, I, actually, I, 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 to... I actually asked the physician to do it. I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's not, not the me surgery. that they refer to me. Okay. No, no, no. By the time they refer to me, is ready for surgery. Okay. Sure. So, sure. so that, refer so to me. I said, yeah. yeah, that's a different kettle of fish. What, what you mm. you've explained now is very clear. That actually, yeah. it is the pulmonologist who put it in. It gives you time to go and talk to the family and things like that. And yeah. uh, I, I personally, in my practice, uh, do not uh, allow any of my juniors to put in fibrinolytics into the chest. Sure, sure. For us, if I'm going not, to operate, I, I want to get in there and operate. And, and the data sure. is not yet clear. We don't have mm. a good randomized study. There are a couple no, of things. No. Uh, you know, answering Fitun's uh, question about TPA versus streptokinase, there is some <laughs> e evidence that uh, TPA might be better than streptokinase. But honestly, sure. I don't know the correct answer to that. So yeah. I, I am okay with the, you know what you've explained. Now, one mm -hmm. question which has come through, Adrian, is what is the sequence of decortication in the chest? Do you uh, go in a particular way uh, or, or do you just do, depending on wherever is the loculation? Okay. Um, a lot of time, um, if the physician refer or patient come early, I, I find that the, of course, the, 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 the power pneumonia effusion is always starts from the bottom up, right? Because you have infusion at the lower lobe and then they organize all the way up. So if it's only a lower lobe uh, uh, decortication, I try to do my anterior window slightly lower, okay? Of course, the approach is I will study the CT scan very carefully very carefully because you can count the rib where you want to go in and that's you cannot just go in blindly okay if you go in blindly you may chip the lung and then you start bleeding and the air leak and it's very difficult so the, the window is more or less tailored towards uh, where the collection is the most and how you want to put the scope or where you want to put the drain yeah sure. and the reason why i always want to put my window um, a bit more anteriorly is because that's where I'm going to tunnel my drain outside. So if I put my drain uh, posterior to the mid axillary line, it's, really, it's going to be very uncomfortable for the patient when they lie flat. So I always tend to do it a bit more anteriorly. Yeah. Also, the rib tends to be a bit bigger anteriorly than, than the side. Yeah. yeah, that's a very important point actually. The ribs are very yes, crowded yes. posteriorly, so you come more anterior and there is yeah. more space to get between the ribs and there that's is less right. trauma on the ribs uh, or the intercostal mm. nerve. So that's a very important point for the audience to understand yes, why this uh, Dr. Wee comes yes. anteriorly because it gives you uh, better access. Uh, one of the points I just want to make to the juniors uh, across uh, the platform is that uh, if you're going to go in and do decortication, please try and be pretty aggressive. Uh, try to release the lung as much as possible all around. Yes. I, I personally uh, want to release the hilum completely anteriorly, posteriorly, superiorly and inferiorly because the lung then re-expands. Uh, you know, once you release it completely, the lung will re-expand. The, the best way you get pleurodesis is to allow the lung to re-expand. Uh, if you do not allow the whole lung to re-expand, then you will be left with pockets and that will give uh, rise to recurrence of empyema. So if you yes, talk exactly. with him, you can see how aggressively he's decorticating. He takes his time, he does it nicely, and aggressively decorticates. You know, the, one of the important points he said was, be patient, take your time, it doesn't matter. You know, you, you, this is one option for the patient to get it right, and you have to get it right the first time. So, you know, take your time. Even if it takes 50 times to clean the camera, it doesn't matter.
And uh, Dr. Wee is very right when he said that uh, the person who has the most difficult time in the operation is the cameraman. <laughs> you know, I completely agree with him on that point. Uh, Adrian, can I ask you another question? They, they, oh. they are asking whether, would you use talc after decorticating for pleurodes? That's, uh... hello, uh, Hi, are you still there? Yeah. Yeah, I'm listening. Um, uh, may I ask um, what is the purpose of putting in town? What Absolutely. is the idea of putting in town? Yeah. There is no sense in putting in town because uh, I, I think you are, you've done so much decortication, <laughs> you've created so much inflammation. And in the presence of Empaima, if you put in a foreign material like talc, you're asking for trouble. Uh, you agree, Adrian? I, I mean, I yes, yes, because, not, uh, because the, the purpose of the talc is to cause the lung and pleural irritation, the inflammations, and then the heal by fibrosis. It works well for pneumothorax surgery. Yeah, sure. But uh, for talc in, in, in decortication is that you, you already take away the lung pleural, the visceral pleural, and you put talc inside, the whole lung is going to inflame. You're going to cause a, a, a chemical pneumonitis. Sure. Okay, so so that that is no good. Uh, secondly, talc is a foreign body, and you just give uh, a bacteria a chance to 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 to, 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 to thrive again. And talc may clot your drain. Talc and blood they may clot up, and then when the drain clot, there's no drainage, and the, the, the blood accumulate, and you have unresolving uh, pus inside the cavity. So I think for that three reasons, and uh, maybe we shouldn't put talc. Yeah, not a good yeah, idea. I, I completely <laughs> agree with you. I want to reiterate this message, which you so clearly told. Please do not put in talc post empyema decortication. The yeah, one thing I do do following the surgery is I wash the space with betadine, yes. hydrogen peroxide, and saline solution. So yes, betadine yes. Uh, gives chemical uh, debridement and, and the hydrogen peroxide adds uh, value by stopping all that oozing from the raw surface and, and the saline helps you to wash it out. And, and we use generous amounts. So, you yes. know, liters and liters of wash out before you put in the drain. Uh, because and, and there's a lot are, of... Yeah, sorry. And they are safe. They are safe to use them. Very safe. safe. Yeah, that's yes, the point. Safe, that yeah. It's quite safe, yeah. actually. And, and the reason you wash out is because there's a lot of toxins present within the pus and uh, whatever bugs are there, when you wash it out, actually you see that the patients postoperatively start to feel better. The sepsis, that the systemic sepsis that they are having before surgery will actually disappear with a really good washout. So washout right. is highly recommended uh, as, as uh, Dr. Will said. Uh, another question that they have asked, uh, Adrian, is uh, what if this is a metastatic localized pleural effusion? Would you do debridement decortication in this sort of patient because the primary etiology is not likely to be addressed? I think, um, yes, is, um, you see, for metastatic cancer or primary cancer, you have malignant effusion. Um, so the the, the the surgery is a bit different. So if you drain the blue effusion, you put tau and the lung we expand. And so so that will solve the problem. But however, they are patient with the malignancy, malignant infusion, and then they also have obstructive pneumonitis, pyronemonic effusion, then they have malignant effusion that become infected. So those are difficult to treat, to be honest, very difficult to treat. And they are not resolving. Um, it depends how big it is. Um, if they are localized, if they are localized, I mean, by definitions, uh, if they have malignant infusion, they are stage four, right? They are stage four lung cancer. So they have lim limited life expectancy. So let's try to make it a bit more comfortable for them. We can put a, a, a window with a small drain Okay, and then do a permanent drainage. You can go in, do baths and wash out the whole thing and put a small drain. So get rid of the infection first. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I mean, that's uh, what I would do, really. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Adrian. I, I think doing a decortication in a terminal patient uh, and landing him with a air leak uh, is, is actually complicating the situation. 
So yeah. what you really need to do is go in, wash out, and get out. And uh, very often, if you connect them to a digital suction device, uh, they help the lung to come up. Uh, mm, and yes, right. uh, the one of the other options, which uh, my friend uh, Gianluca Casali actually published on this, is he used a Plurex drain uh, in in malignant epipyemas to see whether there was any benefit or, on that. And his personal experience has been that after doing VATS decot, after doing VATS washout and clearing all the debris, putting in a Plurex drain and sending them home actually allows the lung to gradually re-expand over a period of time because of the negative suction. So he, he, he is now in Bristol and he has published on this. And uh, so there are many options, but I, I think decortication is a bit much for a malignant, yeah. uh, for a terminal yes. malignant patient. Yes. Your so idea again, is just uh, to get rid of the sepsis. Just, just explain the Plurex drain to them and where did the drain tunnel to? Yeah, actually, I, I, I did do a, a talk uh, previously. Ah, good, good. I spoke to them about the Plurex drain. So the Plurex mm -hmm. drain is like an indwelling drain. It's got a one-way valve in it. So you make a, you, 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 you put it through a subcutaneous tunnel, just like he was talking about the window. Uh, so he, you, the Plurex drain is a thinner drain. You put it through a subcutaneous tunnel. It comes out uh, from a point uh, far away from your incision. And then, uh, you know, it gets stuck to the chest wall and the patient goes home and every so often he can connect it to a bottle and allow the fluid or whatever else to drain out. So I, I have actually shown them a video of how the fluid drain functions. Uh, one of the questions, I like this question, uh, Aiden, this is a, a very nice one. It's a simple one. What is VATS debridement as opposed to VATS... Uh, Decortication. What, what do you ah. mean by the term vats? Sure, sure. So, if you, if you, if the patient has a power pneumonia effusion, for example, about three weeks ago, okay, mm. uh, and after drainage, uh, the lung refused to come out. Mm. So, and you look at you, when you see the CT scan, there, there's not much uh, thickened visceral pleura, okay? Mm -hmm. the, the, the pleura hasn't been thickened, but however, there's a loculated effusion. So, it's about stage two, stage one. So you do a vet, you do a washout, you debride means that you, you just like incision and drainage, you debride the cavity. You, 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 you scrape all the, 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 the fibrin cloth and you clear all the fibrin cloths. You do a proper washout, however you do, and then if the lung expand, that's it. You don't have to do a prorectomy if the lung can expand through it. Okay, and that's what I mean by plural debridement. Yes. So it's usually for stage one or two empire, the early empire right. yes. where the cortex right. has not yet formed. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, well, one question is: Do you can you on a CT tell us if the, it is if the lung is destroyed, and you should not embark on an empire? Okay. It, it is not easy. However, there is a telltale sign because you see, uh, when a tissue dies in our body, when a tissue is damaged our body replaces it with calcium, okay? So, and if you see a lung that has been collapsed completely, uh, the cortex is thicken, but instead, but you don't really see any lung tissue, it's, it's surrounded with calcium. So that is indicated that the lung may not be viable anymore. So I've seen my colleague go in and do a thoracotomy, and do a full decortication, take out all the cortex, and all you see is the lung that is destroyed, and with the calcium, and then when the nurses try to back, the lung refuses to come out, except we have helix, and there we are, we are in a problem. So a, CD scan, a good CT scan can tell you if there's a calcium on the parietal pleura, no sorry, on, on the visceral, on, on visceral pleura, and the calcium on the lung parenchyma, it's just a telltale sign that the lung may not be viable anymore. And generally, if someone say, oh, I have pro effusion for six months. So I have patients that refer to the government hospital that six months ago, they already have stage three empyema. But the patient is not feeling unwell and he ran away until he, become a he has a respiratory failure. And when he come back, Oh, it is, yeah, instead of doing a decortication, it's too late. It's just a window. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, thanks, Adrian. Uh, can I just request everybody to switch off your microphones? Just leave Adrian and my uh, microphone on. And whoever wants to ask the question, just type it. And I will ask your question one by one. Uh, you got to understand it's it's one o'clock or one thirty for uh, Dr. Ui. So it's very kind of him to wait uh, around and uh, answer your question. But we'll try and get through as many as we can. Yeah, uh, it's okay. So, so Adrian, tell us what was the hemostatic powder that you used? Uh, it's called star seal. It's, it's something like the surgery cell. Okay, but instead of a surgery cell, it's, it's like a surgery cell powder. Uh, to be honest, um, I tried a few times. I don't really find it particularly helpful. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just tried it. But after a few times, and uh, I, I never tried again. Uh, but as I said, if you worry about bleeding, you, you wash it out completely, warm saline. You can pack it until it stops. You can ask the anesthetist to give FFP. And eventually, you will, it, the bleeding will stop. And also that uh, I find out that the thickened pleura actually bleeds a lot. But after you decot it, the bleeding actually stops. Especially from the brighter pleura, when you touch it, it just bleed. But when you decot it, the bleeding just stop because the the blood vessel from the intercostal, when you tear it, they go into spasm and then they they clot. Okay. So, but the pleura bleeds a lot. But after you decot, trust me, the bleeding actually stops. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So uh, yeah. another question is coming saying. Um, is there any difference between TB empyema and post pneumonic empyema? I'm assuming he's asking in terms of surgical technique. Uh, uh, that's what I, I gather from the question. Okay, um, surgically, there's, I, I don't find any difference because empyema is the way our body, uh, the lung, the chest wall, the pleura react to inflammation. It's not reacting to bacteria, it's reacting to inflammation. Okay, so you will have stage three empyema. You do the same sort of surgery. But, uh, secondly, is a sec uh, most of the time we don't know whether the patient has TB because the TB is really difficult to catch. The culture may not be positive, but when you send the pus and when you send the 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 the, 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 the cortex for 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 histology, they say, "Wow, this is could be suggest." Of TB, and we start the patient on treatment, TB treatment after surgery. So in the government hospital, and uh, then we 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 have to wear N95 masks to do uh, decortication, and that is torturing because for three hours of N95 masks, you try to talk to people, and it, it's, it's no easy feat. Okay, so many times we only know that the patient's TB after the result come back. So uh, we a lot of time we don't have a clue. But the also uh, the thirdly, I want to stress is that TB empyema, the, 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 the mortality rate is about five times higher because they, they have multiple resistant TB and uh, the pneumonia is, is worse. So the basic, the lung infection is worse and the lung is weaker for TB uh, empyema. And yeah, so because we did a small series uh, study and we, we, we did a presentation the mortality rate is something like 16% of thoracic surgery for TB alone uh, compared to, uh, it's one of the highest and um, yeah, it's, it's shocking. Yeah. So what do you do in the presence of active TB agent? Do you operate on them or do you give them anti-tuberculosis for a certain period of time? Uh, we we resuscitate them, them first. Together? Yes, same. We, we resuscitate them first. Uh, make sure the coughing stop. Make sure the, the sepsis is under control. And if they are fit for it, then after that, we, we do it. At least we, we give them at least a week or two. They can wait. If they are not unwell, they can wait. They can wait, yeah. Okay. So yeah. what is the best way out if you are left with a pocket of loculated effusion after surgery? Ah. Okay. So when you see a pocket of effusion after the decortication, um, the first thing I would do is to make sure I don't do it again in the next case. Because usually the pocket of effusion is you forget 
mostly is you forgot to to free up the trap lung. Okay, the trap lung has pocket effusion inside. If you don't untrap it, that pocket effusion become pocket pus and pyema, and it started to grow. So the, the lesson is to really have to free up all the trap lung. Okay, when you free up all the trap lung from the pleura, I guarantee you that you you really don't have a uh, pocket effusion. Okay. Now, secondly, when the mistake is done and a pocket effusion is still there, you can get the ultrasound guided drainage because it's very difficult to, for you to surgically poke where you want to poke. Because now ultrasound pigtail drainage is very good. The rest of the lung is already clean. With that little pocket, you ask the interventionalist for help. This would be the easier way out. To go back in is a real big mobility out there for the patient. The healing at the restart. So the easiest way out is usually the best way. So I think so the easiest way out in this is in this case is the ultrasound kind of drainage for the pocket drainage. I see that. Okay, yeah. I mean I, I completely agree with you that uh, going back in is shouldn't be the option. In in the scenario which uh, has been described by Vikas, what I would do is I would look at the patient and see how he is clinically. And, and I know that I've washed everything out. I know I've done a good decortication. The lung has re-expanded. Some part didn't re-expand and you're left with a small pocket. If the bottom line is treat the patient, not the x-ray. And, and if, if the patient is clinically getting better, there is no sepsis, nothing like that, just leave it alone and uh, continue with the antibiotics because the treatment of empyema is medical, not surgical. All we are trying to do is facilitate uh, early recovery from sepsis. And the treatment of TB is also medical. So I would then just continue with the antibiotics or continue with the antitubercular therapy and follow up the patient in the outpatient. I would not want to uh, fiddle around with uh, re-operating on this patient, for sure. So many yes. times you'll just get away with it. To be honest, you'll just get away. That thing will resolve with a little bit of time. Uh, very rarely do they come back with recurrent sepsis. And if they come back with recurrent sepsis, as Adrian said, you have the option of the radiologist putting in an ultrasound guided uh, pigtail into that small little pocket. Surgically, you will find it very difficult to go in and find the pocket once you've done a decortical because you're going to get severe pleurodesis. So it becomes a very big operation. So if the patient is not septic, don't do anything. Just, you know, ride it out and let him go home. Don't uh, just do serial x-rays and see how it's going. So that, yeah. that would be my take on that. Yes, uh, is yes. there any... Uh, I, 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 yeah, yeah sorry. I, I add on a point because um, a lot of times when you said, hey, I remember in a surgery, I did the best I could. I free up all the trapped lung. There's no mm -hmm. more pocket. How come there's a local effusion? So for in that scenario, you're very sure that you're untrapped all the lung, you're suck out all the effusion. And the drain is in... The chest drain is in good position. However, unfortunately, the, the effusion post-surgery, there's a bit left here and there. But not to worry, because when the lung are fully expanded, they have the ability to absorb the remaining effusion. Correct? Yeah. yeah. So, as Zamir as said, don't treat the chest x-ray. You've done a good job. You, you're confident you've done a good job. And the drain is out. They say, hey, there's a bit of effusion there. But you know that you've done a good job. The lung will reabsorb effusion. If the patient is well, don't do anything. When they come back, you'll be surprised that the vision will be gone. Yeah. Okay. I, I like this question. It says, you're on table for a VADS decortication. Is there any uh, situation in your personal experience where you took the decision to do an open window thoracostomy rather than a VADS decortication? Yes. Yes. Uh, two, two, two scenarios that I came across uh, Sometimes, uh, quite often, that uh, uh, the, the patient is on table for vest decortication and end up just doing a window and a long term chest drain. Um, first is the patient is more unwell than I thought. And the anesthetist said, Adrian, the patient is not well. And I, I have difficulty ventilating and the blood pressure is low, mm. Uh, mm. you know, and, uh, and the heart rate is increasing. The patient is spiking temperature. I mean, the, the sepsis going on so and and this patient are immunocompromised either on long-term dialysis so i will respect the anesthetist telling me that this patient is not doing well on the table 
So the first thing is to uh, stick the drain in, wash out the pleural cavity, and then I come out when the patient is unstable or not doing well on the operating table. So that sure. is a very good decision because you don't want to do a good job end up with a dying patient. There is, there's no justification for that. Number two is mostly is my mistake for trusting my juniors. Okay, they would have put patient on the list for decortication and DCSIM and rely on them to tell me the full history and uh, presentations and the condition of the patient. So they may paint a rosy picture of the patient without actually examining the patient. So I learned that the hard way. The first day I put on the two decortication on the list in the Sedan Hospital, right? The young man, 30 old five and the one is 55. So the first 35 years old, I say, hey, it is easy, right? But when I entered the operating table, I mean, I didn't have time to assess the patient myself, but this is a sort of a senior registrar who, who, who briefed me about the cases. So when I entered the operating theater, the first thing that shocked me is the patient is completely cachexic. He is diabetic, never controlled, on, has been on dialysis for 10 years. He's 35, okay? He is it's like a skeleton. So I said, gosh, this man is not going to survive a full decon. And when I look at the CT scan, I said, nah, I think this one has been for, uh, this lung has been trapped for a long time. So I look at the history of the computer. My goodness, he had it for at least six months. Okay, so I know that I can't do a full decode on this very complex patient. And yes, of course, when I do, uh, when I drain the effusion, when I try to do some decode, there's a lot of bleeding. And he has coagulopathy, and his albumin is something like 20. Okay, so that is even before the surgery starts. So that was my fault that I did not assess the patient myself and rely on my registrar to tell me. So to prevent this situation from happening, you really have to look at the patient, assess yourself, every single case to make sure that he's fit for full decon. Otherwise, you end up with a scenario where on the table, you just realize that he's not fit and the nurses tell you that he's not fit. Okay, that's it, yeah. So just in a nutshell, the answer for everybody is when the patient is not fit, on table you realize, or your anesthetist is worried. So these are very important points which uh, Dr. Wee has brought up. It's very, very important. Okay, don't, you, you have to make a call. You don't want a dead patient on the table. You don't want the patient bleeding and, and you know, things are going really bad. So sometimes you make an assessment pre-op and then when you come to the table, things change. So it's better to just uh, get out safely rather than uh, try right. to do anything heroic out there. Um, yeah. uh, this question is, is actually more about, I think it's related to, uh, there are some papers which talk about radiology size of cortex and all that. So is there any size criteria to not to do decortication? Uh, I, I, sorry, Zabir, I don't understand the questions. The question was, is there any size criteria? They're, they're probably asking about the thickness of the cortex. Uh, some people have done some papers uh, to talk about whether, you know, one mm cortex versus three mm cortex, should you do decortication <laughs> or not? I, I, I completely do not uh, believe in that concept. But the question is asked to you, is there any size criteria to do decortication? Okay, um, no, it, it's not in any of my considerations when coming sure. to surgery. Yeah, it's a patient's fitness, patient condition, the history and the fitness of surgery, and uh, where the where the the, 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 the empyema is, is all my consideration. I think this, the thickness of uh, cortex um, is, is never into consideration, no. no. Uh, another question yeah. is, should you stop steroids before surgery because they are... They, they 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 are anti-inflammatory and prevent pleurodesis. Uh, I think. Uh... Mm, no, uh, it, I I think a lot of patients when they have a full-blown empyema, I don't think any physician will give them steroid, mm. especially when in a septic condition. Mm. Yeah, and if you say that the if the physician says no 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 we give them steroid because the lung is inflamed, so the patient has COPD or the patient has pneumonia. And they said, no, okay, that's fine. Treat the pneumonia first, treat the COPD. When they are treated, stop the steroid, and then you go for operation. Because if the, when the physician gives the steroid, 
is when they uh, fail to control whatever it is because steroid is is the last resort for a lot of yeah. lung physician when they so, are uh, yeah okay yeah so so the the answer is uh, i personally don't like steroids i want them no 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 and, uh, and it not as adrian likes steroids so answer is i think you should try and stop all no it's not yeah correct uh, it's, so it's the, no, there's no another, in there. yeah another very nice question uh, you know we see this quite often because i work in a renal unit uh, is there any special precautions or anything different we do in terms of empyema surgery in chronic uh, renal disease say again uh, you know when you have patients with chronic renal disease uh, who mm -hmm. turn up with empyema is there yes. anything different in your management that you do uh, oh yes guys? yes um, yeah because this this guy with a chronic renal disease right and mostly they 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 uh, cause by diabetes they are already on dialysis mm. and they would uh, they they immune compromise and then uh, they have they have chest infections and they have pneumonia and they have empyema so i would be very careful to get the the the, the sugar level under control and they make sure that you treat the pneumonia well make sure that their albumin is not low okay because this patient are sick and they immune compromised they don't have any reserve okay the lung function is bad so i will treat this patient be careful so the resuscitation part is very important make sure they are well beef up <laughs> make sure the protein level is good and uh, because if they say okay then the sepsis that's fine you stick a chest drain in first yeah. Okay, drain the past, treat the sepsis with antibiotics, then resuscitate the patient with nutrition advice, and then you assess for the fitness. But the principle of the assessment uh, is there, but you have to be careful. These renal failure patients are the, are the high risk, the high risk group. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, Ma, I, I do a lot of uh, these surgeries on CKD patients, and I agree mm. with Adrian, they are very high risk patients. You must get them medically fit, uh, um, intraoperatively, pre-op. Uh, pre we look at the clotting coagulation profile in quite detail because they also have liver problems usually associated with the, the disease. So I will always top them up with any anticoagulation uh, prophylaxis that I want to give, uh, you know, FFPs and things like that. Uh, my decortication will be uh, to a much radical, much lesser radical extent as I would do in a normal patient. So, because bleeding is a big issue with these guys and they, they, they don't do very well uh, in the post-op period. And of course, immune compromise is a big issue, particularly in the transplant groups. Uh, so I am, I, my, my aim is to quick in, quick out, wash out as much as I can, do uh, whatever decortication is safe enough to do. There is no, no hard and fast rule. There are no guidelines. You have to set it according to patient by patient. And, and uh, you know, and uh, your anesthetist is the best, best uh, friend that you have in theater who will actually tell you, uh, Dr. Khan, please stop enough. So, you know, uh, you need to know when to stop. The, otherwise, That's you right. end up with more trouble uh, than, uh, than the outcomes because uh, you could have a perfect decortication, uh, perfectly expanded lung, but a dead patient. So that's not good for you. Uh, I, I like this question. The next question, Adrian, is very nice. Could you share some tips about management of parenchymal tears and alveolar air leaks? Uh, management of what, sorry? Management of tears, lung tears, parenchymal tears and alveolar air leaks. So how do you manage uh -huh. air leak in these <laughs> in the post-operative period? Okay. Um, if if there's a lot of air leaks, uh, basically uh, don't don't panic because remember as I said you treat the underlying pneumonia first, okay? So if you're, there's no pneumonia, you do a decortication. There will there will be air leak, but the air leak will stop if the lung tissue is healthy. Okay, the air leak will stop. So important is your chest drain must be a big size so that it doesn't get blocked up, okay? Don't put a single drain, put two drain, a pickle drain and a basal drain, huge drain, size 36 if you can, okay? So you to drain the air, so it allow the lung expansion to happen. Um, I, I try a few times when after I finish decortication, 
Okay, I know that the, the patient has no sepsis, no, uh, no pneumonic lung underneath. You can spray glue. For example, if you intraoperatively, you know that, oh, that section, you actually tear a lot of lung parenchyma tissue rather than just uh, visceral pleura. And if you try to stitch, it may not work. So in that, in those cases, I, I, I um, not, not the flow seal, but tissue or even cold seal, use a spray. You spray a layer on top of them. They act like a natural pleura, okay? It actually reduces the amount of air leak. However, if the lung expand, the air leak will stop. Trust me, the air leak will stop. Okay, when the lung expand, absolutely, the lung is healthy, it will stop. Yeah. Yeah. So really, the key thing is to make sure that you completely decorticate, get the lung to re-expand in the post-operative period. We usually use digital suction device. I am I am a great fan of uh, Topaz. Uh, I will get the patient to mobilize really fast. Physiotherapy is extremely important, and uh, yoga therapy in my center it, it works wonders. So the only way you can stop air leak after uh, decortication is to get uh, the lung to touch the chest That's wall, yeah. and to have it uh, have pleurodesis happen naturally. So air leak is not really so much of an issue. It's over over emphasized by a lot of people. Very often you get a prolonged air leak because you have not done adequate decortication and you've not taken everything down. So what happens is one area is stuck up and uh, you've released some area which is leaking air and that area which is stuck up actually holds the air leak open and then there is no chance for that lung to stick to the chest wall. So the answer to this is really good uh, decortication and then post-operative, all of the measures to get the patient mobilized really early. Uh, okay, uh, there is a question asking about descending necrotizing mediastinitis with bilateral empyema. The answer is very simple for that. Uh, I think you've got to just drain both the sides ag aggressively. Uh, so that, that, that's what you have to do. So uh, uh, next question is how much air leak is accepted on ventilator in OT for closure? Okay. Um... I think there's no fast rules on what is acceptable air leak because if the anesthetist fail to ventilate, we have a problem, right? We have a problem uh, because you're causing so much tear that uh, they, they cannot, they fail to ventilate, we have a problem already. So we have to, before we close up the chest, uh, we always ask the anesthetist to, I mean, the lung is fully expanded, right? Then we say, okay, when the lung is expanding and the anesthetist can ventilate both lungs very nicely and the air leak is acceptable by them and there's a good PO2, good CO2, so that, that's fine. The problem is that when the air leak is so much that there's a tear in the lung and so you, in that case, you may have to find out where, which part of the lung has the most air leak. You may have to go back and suture them or, or put a glue because... The easiest way to find out is that before you close the chest, when the anesthetist blocked the lung, and the anesthetist said, oh, I can't ventilate the patient, and there's no oxygenation, and it's inadequate, you can fill up the cavity, thoracic cavity with water and see which part has the biggest bubble come out. That usually is a cost for, 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 for fail of ventilation, and you, you, you have to do whatever you can to minimize the alley on that area. Yeah. And I don't have any... Uh, actually, I forgot now. Um, if the in 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 the um, in in the digital drain, if the air leak is something below two hundred, they are quite okay. But if anything above a thousand or two, you uh, usually the ventilation will fail. Is that right, Samir? No, actually, the newer drains actually can take up to five thousand, so it's not a problem on on the digital drains. Uh, so no, no, I know. I mean, uh, in, yeah. in 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 yeah. terms of ventilation, because yeah, no, they have been reset. The, the 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 softwares have all been reset, and uh, okay, okay. Uh, most of the times, the the newer digital chest drains can actually take a fair amount of air leak, but they do fail after three thousand. The the air leak, uh, the the device cannot. <coughs> uh, but if you look at the literature, they say up to 5,000, they can actually take uh, air leak, wow. according to no. the literature. But most of the times, mm. uh, 
air leak is an oh, is not such a big problem it's, we don't look at the amount of air leak what we yeah. see is that you've done the decortication initially you're going to have air leak as long as they are able to extubate the patient on table i will accept whatever is the air leak because i know i've not it's not a bronchopleural fistula it's an alveolar air leak that's the difference between the two yes so right. alveolar air leak always stops uh, with with time 24 48 hours it will stop uh, the right. key is are they able to extubate the patient or not and i will stand there till they extubate the patient and exactly. because you are there you give confidence to the anesthetist that mm. uh, you know if if there's a problem i will deal with it so it is important that you work as a team and That's and right. you yeah. you sort of uh, you know so really this concept that i cannot ventilate the patient i have personally not really come across uh, this situation maybe once That's or right. so but uh, I think more, you wait more, and it all more, settles mostly for pneumothorax surgery where as a bronchopleural fistula air leak as you said that is a trouble uh, a alveolar air leak is usually is, is manageable yeah that's right yeah absolutely and and, and no. the key to stop the, uh, the 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 air leak sooner is actually extubation because yeah, extubation the, the the air leak was immediately was stopped right because absolutely. if you do a positive air pressure you continuous air leak so when you extubate you will be surprised who oh, the air leak actually reduce or stop yeah absolutely right. yeah. yeah so there is another question saying uh, in the old days they used to put this intrathoracic stitch to the chest tube uh, i am assuming he's talking about the the pin that you put i, I didn't understand the question uh, i don't know if you can make sense of it is there any role for intrathoracic stitch to chest tube for maintaining proper position What, what I see. Is an so, so basically, uh, they they want the ideal positions of the chest tube putting on. I mean, or they go to apical and also go to the cross-offending angle. Uh, people do it by stitching to the chest wall. Oh, uh, I however, see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but I think if the lung, if you put the chest tube where it was, and you see the lung fully expanded, the lung will hold the chest tube in place. You don't really need to stitch it. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Rajkumar Yadav is one of our very very senior surgeons uh, mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of experience with TB surgery, and uh, his his comment to your uh, point about uh, not doing surgery after six months uh, is, uh, uh, and and I actually agree with him because that's been my experience as well. He says in India, patients come late, even sometimes even after a year uh, after our open surgery decortication. And, and uh, the success result is very good. In fact, 75% uh, re-expansion of the lung. So that that has also been my experience. So I don't I don't have a cutoff for uh, beyond a certain point. But I understand the patients that you're describing where the severe calcification and things like that. But for me, a time cutoff is not there. Uh, I have personally done decortications on people who are who are one year down the road and still manage to get the lung up. The lung is a very forgiving organ. That's the reality. But of course, if it is completely destroyed, then it will not come up, and, and that yeah. is that is. Uh, that so so fun. so it, it, right. I mean, there's no cut off cut off point. Is, uh, you, no, you, you, no you have to point. you have to yeah. you have to really assess the CT scan. But of yeah. course, if the lung is full of calcium, I will really doubt that the lung is going to a calcified lung will expand altogether. Uh, yes, um, you can say that. Oh, it's six months. I don't do the surgery. No. The six pan, you show that the, the you know the lung is is still quite healthy underneath, no calcification. You know they have taken co uh, cortex. Yes, you can do the calcification, no problem. Yeah, don't don't get me wrong. Six month is not my cutoff point. There are patient coming on the six uh, six month is very common. What happened in India happened in Malaysia too. We have not much difference in terms of our our facilities and delay in the referral. Same. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Jha is asking us: When you do the visceral decortication, uh, do you expand the lung, or is the lung deflated? Um, initially, the lung is always trapped. So, once you get the opportunity to tear one piece, that will continue to tear more. But of course, to me, sometimes it's easier if the anesthetist. Blow up the lung a little bit, Absolutely. so you know the expansion as you tear along. So it depends. 
Yeah, yeah but no, it so is very helpful. It is very helpful when you take the cortex and you peel and, and miss this uh, inflate partially. And it's very satisfactory when you peel, the areas start to expand. It's yeah. wonderful. Yes. So, uh, Andre, in answer to your question, as uh, Dr. Ui said, I actually, uh, what I do is I tell the anesthetist, you are the one who's going to do the decortication. I'm going to hold the cortex up. So, you know, as I, once I've made an incision on the, on the cortex up to the, sub, up to the plural level, I'll hold the cortex up and I'll show him on the screen and I'll say, now please blow it as my peanut is dissecting. So it, it's a combined effort between the anesthetist and the surgeon. I personally, when you start off with making the incision on the cortex, the lung is down. And then as you start peeling off and start doing more decortication, you actually find that inflating the lung helps you with your decortication and you make more progress when you're inflating the lung because you understand what is the correct plane. It is th That plane is millimeters thick. You have to really get into the correct plane uh, otherwise, you are get, going into lung tissue. So uh, I, I personally like the lung to be inflated rather than deflated when we're doing this uh, uh, question, uh, when we're doing this situation. Uh, is bronchopleural fish, what if bronchopleural fistula is associated with the empyema? What's your strategy, Adrian? Okay, so you have empyema and is associated with bronchopleural fistula. The bronchopleural fistula is it due to surgical? No, no, no. He's talking about about a tuberculous cavity, which has got the, a large communication with with the segmental bronchus. You know the the bad lungs with the yes, yes. leaking uh, pass out through that fistula. That's yeah. It. So 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 you, you can draw the blue debridement. You wash out. And then you look at the lung. I mean, for you can assess the lung. If the lung is completely uh, have massive block of pleural fistula due to the destruction of by TB, you may have to do the lobectomy or sigmoidectomy. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, you have uh, failed ventilations. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, my, my my answer to this question would be that. Uh, Usually, uh, the risk of bronchopleural fistula on table or, or seeing bronchopleural fistula is actually highly exaggerated. We, we all, I've done a lot of these surgeries, uh, over 1,000 cases, and I personally do not believe that you should suture these things because the lung is not good and you will inadvertently, it will just cut through. No, so it, if it, it, is it, a, it is a lung resection, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so if you have to do something like that, then lung resection may be an answer, or you can staple that area if you think. But suturing is that's not right. very good in that area. No. It usually doesn't work. But my personal experience has been is most of the times you get the lung to re-expand. The moment it re-expands and touches the chest wall, all of this uh, problem will get solved. Some people That's talk right. about suturing bronchopleural fistulas. Some people talk about putting in patches on it and all that. Uh, I am not so sure whether it works. But, but, you know, there is no right or wrong answer to this. Uh, but personally, I try to uh, really release the lung all around. And if I do feel that there is an area of bronchopleural fistula which will not heal, I do have staplers which will work for me. So that's, that's the way we do it rather than suturing. Um, uh, okay. What else do I need to ask? Uh, despite all efforts, if the lung does not uh, expand as the pair is more on decortication, what is the next, uh, what to do next? What to do next? Uh, you have the unviable lung, right? So if, you, if you've done the full decortications and the lung is uh, not expanded, Basically, uh, it's either non-viable or you have a pneumonic lung. The lung is still have pneumonia, it's still consolidated, and it's not going to expand. It's not going to expand. Um, you have no choice. You've done your job, you put in the chest drain, and you may have to write it out. But um, if the lung is consolidated, we have a problem because um, they, they, they don't fare very well. They don't. They have respiratory failure. And because so, they can't extubate, there's no gas exchange. You can't you can't ventilate because there's so much air leak. Um, but if it's only part of the lung or is in one of the lobe, you may have to do the lung resection. 
So my, my take on this is different. I think, uh, you know, if you've got a really destroyed lung and uh, you've got empyema, active infection there, uh, I agree with you, you drain that space and come out, but you probably might need to plan a thoracoplasty or a window for this patient uh, for as a next step operation. Yeah. Or you might have to uh, plan uh, putting in a muscle flap uh, for mm. these patients. Uh, these are all, but, but I personally don't do it in the same sitting because I want the infection to be controlled. The fact that I'm going in is for control of infection. So I will drain the whole sure. space, I will wash yes. it all out, and then at a second sitting, I will go in and do a thoracoplasty, yes. or I'll do, in my personal practice, we do muscle flaps and omentum. So I will pull it, put in omentum. The same thing, same answer goes for the bronchopleural fistula as well. That if, if it is an issue and post-operatively I'm worried about it and the space is uh, becoming a problem, I will go back in a second stage and put in a muscle flap or an omentum into yes, that yes. space to fill up so the I think, space. I, I think, uh, I think as, as a first stage, when you do the pro development, you do a decord, the lung is there, not expanding. You have to put the chest drain in or you just do a, a long-term drain or you do a window. The lung, the there lung is, heals, it is there expand. a role? Yeah. Is there type, a role type of your question. Type your question. Type your question. Uh, no, there is. Uh, I, I personally do not want to do pneumonectomy in the presence of uh, infection. I actually do not want to do even lung. No, 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 no. Presence no, of infection. You, you, no, I, no, I will yeah, not. Yeah, I, no. I don't like that yeah, uh, yeah. concept. You'll end up in a big problem. Uh, the principle is always quite straightforward. Control the infection, drain the space. Get the patient better, and then in a second stage, you That's do right. whatever, That's right. whatever else yeah. that you need to do. Yeah. Uh, pneumonectomies uh, in the presence no, of infection no. are disastrous. You will lose the patient with bronchopleural fistulas. That's right. So personally, yeah. I I would do it as a staged procedure. That's right. Yeah. I think Professor Kumar is asking the same question: role of muscle flaps and thoracoplasty when lung does not expand after empyectomy. We did speak about it. I think. Uh, Yes, uh, it's yes. better to do it as a second, uh, a second stage, stage than, not the first stage. Yes. Rather than when the patient is septic. So that's right. Uh, yeah. I have not been in a situation where we've done it at the same sitting. Uh, um, you know, it's better to clean the whole area, just get the pus out, put in two large drains if you need, and then uh, stabilize the patient. And then at a second sitting, you can do thoracoplasty. Uh, Rajan Santoshan talks about it. Uh, mm. Doctor, uh, doctor. Uh, uh, Divan talks about it, and they they also would do a, either a window and let all of the pus out, and then do a thoracoplasty as a second stage. Uh, Rajan's view is the same. Uh, he he always advocates that try not to do thoracoplasty in the presence of active infection. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I, I, think, I, think, I think that that yeah. that questions um, come back to the this slide. We'll answer that right. Um, Yeah. Okay, so for a high risk patient, intraoperative drainage. Okay, and you do the minimum, you drain and control the sepsis, and you do whatever it is later on. Okay, or do an open window, simple and safe procedure for high risk patient. Okay, yeah, or I, I later want... stage when everything is clean, you can do as, as Amir said, drain, drain the pus, control the sepsis come back and deal with the, the rest later on. Don't, don't do everything at one. Yeah. I want two people to come in and give a couple of comments. One is Dr. Yadav, Rajkumar Yadav. If you can switch on your microphone, if you're still on with us. Sir, I would like to hear your comments uh, and some tricks and uh, tips for the audience. If you're still there, sir, switch on your phone, uh, switch on your microphone. And, and also, I would like Professor R.V. Kumar to come in and uh, give us a couple of uh, points on this uh, uh, very complex uh, topic, actually, because it's something that we deal with every day. And yes, yes. there are no real guidelines with these things. Uh, mm. Is Professor Kumar still with us? R.V. Kumar? R.V. Kumar? He, he's still here. Professor Kumar, do you want to come come in, switch on your microphone and just give us a little bit input into, into Empaima surgery? And uh, Dr. Yadav, Rajkumar Yadav, I'd like to hear Dr. Yadav's views as well. If Is they may Yadav not be here at that moment. 
<laughs> yeah, they may have left actually. So. They, they may have left uh, to go the, to the toilet break, maybe. <laughs> 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 okay, I think I think that's that's we've had a good discussion. We've had a good uh, uh, sort of uh, survey of what we need to do. Uh, it is important to look at the literature as well. Uh, there mm -hmm. are no real guidelines at the moment. We are working with no. uh, with the societies to try and develop some sort of guidelines. Uh, most of us uh, go with the experience of the senior. Uh, 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 surgeons in the country, right. Rajan Santosham, yeah. Dr. Devan, give us uh, a lot of yeah. insight into this. Uh, me yeah. personally, I I do a lot of my work by bats. Uh, almost, uh, uh, you know, 95, 96 percent of my decortications are done by bats. I do not worry about the thickness of the cortex. That has not stopped me in the past. And uh, of course, the principle is always the same: that surgery is not the answer for tuberculosis. We are assisting the the situation to help it, uh, you know, to help the medical, the drugs to work better. So we are allowing drainage of pus, get the patient better, so that he can tolerate, uh, so that he can tolerate the uh, medical therapy, because the bugs die with medical therapy. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, thank, you. It really thank you very much. Is a huge, huge uh, thank you, thank sir. you to <laughs> Dr. Ajay Louis. Uh, who has taken time out late in the night. It must be almost two o'clock now. And, uh, you know, we are very grateful for you to share this uh, experience with us. And, uh, you know, a lot of our junior surgeons uh, will will probably have never read these papers which you put out there. So I, I would recommend everybody to read these papers. Thomas Mulner's paper is very good. Uh, look at the screen. These papers are up there. Uh, Thomas Mulner has given a very good uh, input into uh, current treatment of uh, thoracic empyema in adults. A very well-written paper and I know Thomas personally and I, I think he, he thinks very well. So thank you very much everybody and thank you very much Adrian. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Good night. Thank you very much everyone. Okay. Uh